Hi, everyone, and welcome to our first Learning Data Live series webinar. I'm Caitlin Heath of Scriptorium, and I'm moderating this presentation today. We are very excited to launch this quarterly series uh, with my colleague Alan Pringle and his presentation, Managing Data Projects in the Real World. This Learning Data Live series is brought to you by Scriptorium, the content strategy experts. Since 1997, Scriptorium has helped companies manage, structure, organize, and distribute content in an efficient way. If you're trying to figure out how the data model can best support your content, or you're setting up a data system, please contact us and we'd love to work with you. LearningData.com and the Learning Data Live series would not be possible without the help from our sponsors. So thank you. Attendees are going to be muted during this webcast, but we still want your input during the session. So go ahead and type your questions and comments at any time in the questions module, and our speaker will answer questions at the end of the session. Go ahead and locate the questions module in the GoToWebinar interface now, so you know where it is. And then also be on the, look at, the lookout during our question and answer portion of the presentation for a link to our evaluation survey. We would really appreciate your feedback. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass things off to Alan. Alan, hey are you there? there? I am here. <laughs> OK, great. OK, I've just shared my screen. I hope we're ready to go. Does it look correct, Caitlin? Yes, it looks good. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Alan Pringle, and today I want to share with you some tips about managing data projects. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I am the Chief Operating Officer at Scriptorium. We are a content strategy consulting firm. We are based in the Research Triangle Park area of North Carolina in the United States. I've written several books including Content Strategy 101 and Technical Writing 101. And I have worked in technical communication and content strategy since 1990. And I have been with Scriptorium since the company was founded in 1997. When I'm not working on content strategy projects, I enjoy spending time in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And I am also a huge fan of pastries and donuts, including this donut you see right here. It is called the Brooklyn Blackout Donut, and I had it in New York. It is a chocolate cake donut that is filled with chocolate pudding that is dipped in a chocolate glaze. And then to finish it off, it's topped with crumbled chocolate cake. So for all you chocolate fans out there, I hope you are counting. That is four kinds of chocolate in one donut. I highly recommend it. And by the way, the shop where I got it is the donut plant in Brooklyn. So if you're ever in Brooklyn, you definitely need to get that donut. Implementing data can feel a lot like you're managing a circus because of all the different things you have to think about and do and sometimes simultaneously. But before you decide to set up your own data circus, there are a few things that I recommend you consider. First, do a content strategy analysis. And what I mean by that is you exa examine your company's business goals and you evaluate how your content should support those goals. If DITA is a good fit, you will move forward with the DITA implementation. Nobody should do a DITA implementation because it's cool or you think it's fun. There should be business reasons for doing it. This presentation also assumes that you're going to take steps to mitigate change resistance throughout every phase of your DITA project. I could talk during this entire hour on change management, but you are not here, you're not here to hear about that. Instead, I will just say, managing change requires good communication during every phase of your project. That's planning, implementation, and maintenance. 
and it also requires targeted training. And what I mean by that is you've got all kinds of different users for your system, full-time professional content creators. You have content reviewers. You may have part-time content contributors. The, tar the targeted training should address the needs of every one of those different participants in your DITA systems. And at the end of the presentation, I'll provide a list of resources, and some of those resources are on develop, developing a business case for DITA and on change management. Now, not every single DITA implementation is going to be exactly the same because each company has its own very specific business goals and requirements. That said, the large majority of DITA projects that I have worked on share these aspects managing people content modeling, evaluating tools and vendors, understanding delivery formats, and considering conversion. And I'm going to offer some tips on how to handle all these different phases of your data implementation. And I'm hoping with that information, you'll be fortunate enough to put together a data circus without scary clowns in it. Nobody wants scary clowns around, especially when you have deadlines on your data project to meet and you've got work to finish because a lot of data implementations, you still have to get your quote, real work done while you're doing the implementation. So scary clowns need to stay very, very, very far away. First, I'm gonna talk about managing people. A data project is not just about technology. Working with people and getting their support are absolutely necessary for your data project to succeed. We content professionals are really big on communicating at the right level with our audiences. And I think we really need to use those communication skills when we're working with all the groups involved in a data implementation. And a data project usually requires you to work with several different teams within your organization. And even if the project is sponsored by a single department, for example, the technical communication team, it's really important to talk to a lot of the other departments and groups, including, for example, the executives in your company. The executive team really does not want to hear about all the details and the, tool, and the tools you're using and how you're configuring them. They don't care about the technical configuration aspects. Instead, I recommend that you talk about anticipated cost savings when you send a proposal to them explaining why you need data. When you actually start your project, you need to have status reports that talk about the percentage complete, if there are budget overruns, if things are under budget, and so on. Essentially, you need to speak in metrics and in numbers to the executives in your company. And I totally realize that I am offering generalizations here, and they border on stereotypes, really. That said, in my experience, most upper management people have zero interest in the nitty gritty technical details of the data process. They just want your project to be implemented within budget. They want it to support the company's business goals. And of course, part of those business goals is usually some kind of cost savings. That's usually how it goes. Content creators. There are not enough lions in this cage to represent all the people who create content in an organization. And you really need to talk to all those different people because DITA opens up the possibilities for reuse, for sharing, and for collaboration. For example, how is your new DITA workflow going to support engineers who both review content and also contribute small bits of content on a part-time basis? Now, your technical communication team, they probably have this fully featured professional strength authoring tool, but is that going to be overkill for, your, overkill for the engineers who are part-time contributors? How can you make writing easy for those contributors? Would a basic authoring tool be better? Maybe a web-based form. So think about the different types of requirements for your content creators. Tools in general are not one size fits all. 
So who is going to support the installation and maintenance of the tools for your DITA project? It is probably your IT department. It is really important to get the IT department involved during your tool selection process, particularly if you're going to have a component content management system, a CCMS. The CCMS is where you store and manage your data source files. And for example, if the IT department does not have the resources to install a CCMS and to maintain it in the months and years ahead, you need to narrow your search down to the CCMSs that offer hosted solutions. The vendor providing the CCMS will handle the maintenance, so there is no burden on your IT team. Don't make assumptions about what your IT department will and will not support in regard to tools. Get them involved in discussions as soon as possible. A common business reason for adopting data is publishing content to multiple channels. I'm talking about PDF, web pages, and so on. If you are a content team, and this is particularly true of some technical communication teams, if you're a team that is shifting away from PDF slash print only production for your content, you need to get your web team involved as soon as possible when you start to think about the design of web pages and any other web-based output. The web team probably already has style sheets for formatting, and they probably already have an architecture set up for web content that you will need to include or adapt for the web content you get from your data system. For example, your web team can tell you how to integrate site navigation into your web content and the search engine for the website into your HTML content. There are many, many, many more lions and other departments that you need to talk to and maybe even tame. And some of these groups include content consumers. If you can get input from both external and internal content consumers, please do it. And if you cannot get access to your customers uh, who have purchased your product or service, you can probably get their feedback from your support team. The support team is the group that hears complaints and praise from customers, and a lot of those complaints and praise are about product content. And we all know it's usually complaint. People rarely call to say, hey, your stuff is great. So the support team is not only a good resource to get customer feedback, but they are likely an internal consumer of your content. They will look at it to answer customer calls, questions, and so on. So be sure that your new database workflow is going to address any deficiencies in content from your external customers and your internal customers like your support team. If the process for writing content about your company's product is changing, the people who manage the development of those products, they need to know about the changes that are coming. You have to consider development schedules, product release dates, maintenance, and so on when you're figuring out the times to implement your DITA project, because you don't want to be implementing DITA when you have a huge new release just around the corner. So look at the overlap and conflicts uh, on schedules in regard to product development. Creating content as DITA is completely different than creating content in a desktop publishing tool. And by extension, the approach to localizing DITA XML files is also completely different than localizing desktop publishing files. So check with your localization team or your local, localization vendor and be sure that they can work with XML source instead of desktop publishing files. Want to move now more into the technical aspects of implementation to talk about content modeling. To figure out how your content can fit the DITA model, 
you determine how the components that make up your content, for example, the steps in a procedure, how those components will align with the elements that are in the data model. What you can do is create a spreadsheet that lists all the types of formatting tags that you have in your content and then figure out what the data equivalents are. So basically you're just creating more or less like a mapping file. Here is the tag in my desktop publishing tool. Here is the data element that's the equivalent. And seeing how your existing information would work in data is a really, really good exercise to help you learn the data structures, but you've got to be really careful not to focus just on how you created content in the past. It is very unlikely that you followed data best practices in your old content, and why would you have? Because you weren't working in data. So you need to be aware of what you may need to change, or maybe even just throw out and start over again to make your content good quality data. Treat the mapping of your existing content types as a starting point and realize that that document that shows that mapping is going to evolve and change as you get a better understanding of how data works. At the beginning, it's really going to be a living document. Metadata, which is data about your data, is crucial to managing your content. In DITA, most of your metadata goes into element attributes. And I'm gonna show you some code samples in a minute. I promise things will not get super scary, no scary clowns. It's gonna be very basic code and this is the only code you're going to see during this presentation. You can use attributes to filter content. For example, if you have a paragraph that is just for beginner level audiences, you can use the audience attribute as shown here in this little line of code to specify audience level. If you have an entire topic, for example, a task topic with a procedure in it that applies just to one product or just one model, you can use the product attribute at the topic level to label that topic accordingly. And it's also worth noting that metadata is not just at the topic or paragraph level. In DITA, you use a mechanism called a map file, and that map file collects topics together to create an information product such as a PDF book, a help set, an ebook, or whatever you're using to distribute your content. And for those of you out there who are familiar with FrameMaker, Map files are very similar to book files in FrameMaker. It's the mechanism to create several bits of content and combine them into one information deliverable. There is a special kind of map file that's called a book map. It has additional elements in it for adding metadata that you need to publish a book. There are elements that are especially for tracking publication level information. And if you look at the code sample, that last one up there, you'll see that there is an element for the addition and for the is been number to explain the um, information for that particular publication. Do you need to create a new element or attribute type? In DITA, you create new elements and new attributes by basing them on existing ones. That process is called specialization. Unless you have a really good understanding of the existing content models in DITA and you're absolutely certain that you cannot adapt existing elements and attributes for your purposes, I would recommend, especially early on, avoiding specialization because it does create a significant cascade effect. You have to adjust your authoring tool. You will have to adjust your component content management system and other tools to include that specialization. If you are handing out files to other groups, uh, including your localization vendor, for example, they will have to make those same adjustments on their end to include the specialization. So be sure you are aware of the ripple effects of specializing and be sure those changes are distributed 
throughout. Constraints let you reduce the number of elements and attributes that are in your data content model. If you know that authors and content contributors will use just certain elements and attributes, it is worth considering hiding those elements and attributes they won't use because it will make authoring easier. But just like with specialization, though, I would recommend that you gain a really thorough understanding of the data model before you start making changes and constraining what's available. Um, basically, let your authors work inside data for a while and observe how they're using it. And with that information, I think you can make a decision, decisions in regard to constraints a little more intelligently. You'll also need to determine how to use some other very particular data constructs. And these constructs include something called a conref. A conref inserts a chunk of text. For example, if you have a warning in your content that is shared across a product library, you can set it up as a conref instead of copying and pasting it over and over again. Uh, a conref is very much like a text inset in FrameMaker or a snippet in Madcap Flare. Another special kind of data construct is a key ref. And a key ref is basically a document level variable, such as a product name or a company name. Uh, they are basically the equivalent to variables in FrameMaker, Microsoft Word, and other desktop publishing tools. Let's talk a little bit about tools right now. So when you are figuring out how your content should support your company's business goals, it's smart to remember choosing a content tool is not the same thing as developing a content strategy. A tool is not going to do your content strategy analysis for you, and it's certainly not going to manage change for you. And by extension, it's worth mentioning Choosing a tool that supports data does not mean you have a data strategy. You still have to do the content modeling that we just talked about, for example. Don't let current tools and processes become the most important comparison point for you. It is really unfair to compare an XML editor for data to a desktop publishing tool. They are not the same thing. And here's one way of looking at it. If you go to the store to buy a hammer, if you have the feature set of a screwdriver in your mind while you're looking for the hammer, you're going to have a very hard time picking the best hammer. So compile a list of requirements for your tool. Uh, one way to do this is to create, it, to create a weighted spreadsheet. And there I go saying spreadsheets again, but they can be very helpful in managing a data project and really any project in general. With that weighted spreadsheet, you can weight import, important requirements to get higher priority in your decision making. And you don't have to limit your requirements to basic yes or no type questions. You can create very specific short narratives that explain specific use cases and then get feed, vendor feedback on how that vendor's tool can address those specific use cases. When you are talking to vendors, you need to ask very specific questions about how they support data features and constructs. For example, you can ask, how does your CCMS support filtering of content? If you have any discomfort over what you're hearing from a vendor during the evaluation, that's a good indication you will probably still feel discomfort after you purchase that tool. So don't invest money in a tool when you don't like what you're hearing during the tool evaluation process. And I recommend considering a third-party consultant, and yes, I freely admit I am one of those third-party consultants, in developing your requirements and evaluating how well vendors are going to support your particular requirements. A consultant can help you pinpoint system strengths and weaknesses and find the best, best match for your requirements. They have worked through a lot of implementations 
and they know what tools work well in certain circumstances and when they don't work well. I want to talk now about getting delivery formats from your DITA XML, XML content. The DITA Open Toolkit is a collection of open source technologies that enable you to transform your DITA XML source files into PDF, HTML, help, and other formats. It is the most prevalent way of creating delivery formats, but it's not the only one. I want to give you a quick overview of what default output from the DITA Open Toolkit looks like and what you can do to it to customize it to better fit your company's requirements. Here is a page from a PDF file that you get de by default from the DITA Open Toolkit. It is the first page of the Content Strategy 101 book that Sarah O'Keefe and I wrote as DITA. So we ran it through um, the DITA Open Toolkit to get the PDF. This is what you get by default. And as you can see, it is not the most stylish or beautiful thing I've ever seen. Here is another page uh, with the default formatting and it's pretty much ugly. And by the way, that is an eight and a half by 11, a full letter size page and the text pretty much goes across the entire page. So it's a very long line length for people to read. I, I find it very unattractive and, and hard to read. Here is the customized PDF output for the printed version of Content Strategy 101. We went with a smaller page size. I believe it's seven by nine. And you can see that we changed the fonts and the paragraph spacing and other attributes. Here is another page in that book, and you'll notice that the design's a little cleaner. In particular, I think the table is more readable. Here's a sample of the default HTML that you get from the Open Toolkit. As you can see, it is very bare bones, very little styling. We created a custom transform to create WordPress compatible markup language to create the pages on our Content Strategy 101 website. And here is that Content Strategy 101 uh, website, contentstrategy101.com, if you want to check it out. So basically, we created WordPress compatible XML, sucked it into WordPress, and then our theme helped format what you see here. We created a custom transform to create an EPUB ebook version of the Content Strategy 101 content. Here is a page from that book displayed through the EPUB reader extension that you can get for the Chrome web browser. So in summary, I think it's fair to say the default formatting is just plain ugly. The good news is, is that it is fixable and it's totally extensible. So you are not stuck with just the outputs or the look of those outputs. You can change them and use the baseline transforms to create other types of output. I recommend taking a software development approach. You develop requirements for your outputs and then you build from those requirements. For PDF content, you can create a spreadsheet, yep, said it again, spreadsheet, that lists out your formatting details for your heading levels, your paragraphs, your steps and procedures, tables, and whatever else that's in your content. If you want to recreate what you already have in a template file for a desktop publishing tool, you can take all those formatting aspects, the fonts, the line spacing, the indents, the color, and whatever else, for each style and then put that information into the spreadsheet. Putting together very detailed specifications are going to make the, the job of modifying the transforms go much more smoothly. And I'll provide a resource about collecting specifications at the end of the presentation. The open source Apache FOP processor is the tool in the DITA Open Toolkit that helps you transform the DITA XML source into a PDF file. Unfortunately, Apache FOP does not fully support many aspects of PDF formatting, change bars included. I will give you a link at the end to a list 
that shows what FOP does and does not support. You may need a professional FO processing tool such as RenderX or Antenna House Formatter to more fully implement PDF features. And those tools off, also offer extensions that give you a lot more control over the look and feel of your PDF file. Those custom PDF pages from Content Strategy 101, they were processed by the Antenna House formatter. And it's pretty expensive to modify and create transforms. So get, get a good budget to, to do that work. In my experience, a decent baseline, fairly basic PDF transform is going to run at least $12,000, and that's US dollars. And it can be a whole lot more depending upon how complex your requirements are and how specialized your page layout is. Your transforms for web pages, ebooks, and other things may run a little less, but again, it depends on the complexity of your requirements. Another factor affecting cost is the number of languages that a transform needs to support. So if you have localization requirements, expect to spend a little more to get that set up across your default, excuse me, across your transforms. I want to talk now about conversion. Before you even think about starting converting your existing content into DITA, I highly recommend researching DITA best practices. Get a book such as the DITA Style Guide and that's by Tony Self, that offers you advice on the best ways to implement the many elements and the attributes and the different features in the DITA model. Some of your existing source content may not be a good candidate for conversion at all. If your source files are not tagged consistently, if they have a lot of formatting overrides, it will be difficult to very cleanly um, convert that content into the equivalent of data, data topics. So you may be better off just starting over. So sometimes rewriting content and following data's best practices in your new data files is a better solution. Even if you decide you're not going to convert existing content over to data, you still have to have some data content to test your data model and to test your transforms. So create what I call a greatest hits collection of data files that represent a very good cross section of the types of content you create. And I'd recommend maybe 50 to 100 pages of content to be sure that you are very thoroughly testing all of your data processes and the transforms that are creating your outputs. I have yet to see a conversion project completed without some sort of problem or complication. There is gonna be bad tagging or layout quirks or some other scary clown in your legacy source content that's gonna pop up. You can count on it. So resign yourself to the fact you're gonna to have to deal with these surprises and give yourself a lot of lead time on conversion to handle those surprises. One of the most important things I can tell you about successful conversion to DITA is that valid DITA and good DITA are not the same thing. And here's what I mean by that. You can write a generic DITA topic and use an ordered list, you know, one, two, three, four, five, an ordered list, that will approximate the steps in a task. And that ordered list in a generic top, topic, that is valid data. That, that ordered list is allowed in the generic topic and it's valid. But even though that's valid, that is not considered good data. A procedure belongs inside a task topic. The task topic has very specialized elements in it to handle all the aspects of a procedure. So why are you gonna neglect and basically throw away all the intelligence that's built into the names of those elements in the task by creating generic valid data instead of semantically rich good data? So 
when you're working with a vendor, be sure you are getting data that really adheres to the model and best practices and not that is just merely valid. So I want to wrap up and just talk about the keywords that we've discussed in general. Don't implement data content strategy analysis and this reason to do it. Not because it ain't fun, believe me. <laughs> Change management and dealing with people is as important or more so than the technology itself. Choosing data tools is not a data strategy. And finally, as we just discussed, valid data and good data are not the same thing. I promised you a list of resources and here all, all of those are. I am, you do not need to write these down. We are gonna post a recording of this webcast to the news page on learningdata.com and we underneath the recording, we will include this entire list. I do wanna point out the last one, that white paper on data projects. That is basically the white paper version of this webcast. If you have any questions or more in-depth questions, because we're going to take questions and answers in a minute, you can reach out to me at my at email via asp at scriptorium.com. Uh, you can read my tweets at my handle, Alan Pringle. And I also contribute to the company blog at scriptorium.com slash blog. So check that out. It's got some good content strategy and data tips in it. And Caitlin, I'm going to hand things over to you now so we can take questions. Okay, um, so thank you, Alan. I'm gonna start off with a comment from one of the attendees um, about translation. Mm -hmm. um, and they say, you don't need to share specializations with translation vendors if you provide translation packages. Yes, that is accurate. But if you don't, if you don't, if you don't provide those translation packages, they're not going to have that information. It has to get to them somehow, and that's one way to do that. Great. Okay. Um, so, what metrics should I give to executives to show anticipated cost savings? Oh, that's a good question. One thing you can do, and it's in the resources that we'll post on our website. We have an XML calculator. What you do is you put in some information about your content, page count, how long it takes to format pages, et cetera. And it will spit out some numbers and cost savings in regard to, um, you know, because you're automating formatting, what, how that's gonna reduce costs. Uh, localization costs will also be um, reduced if you move to an XML-based workflow. So you need to look at um, those kinds of costs too that are all explained in that calculator. So that's one way of looking at it. But you can also look, for example, at, um, at such metrics as time to market. If you have a product in a source language and it takes you three to six months to get it to markets in other countries because of the translation delay, localization delay, if you shorten that window, you are going to make more money because you're getting that product to those other markets more quickly. In the resources, there is a link to a white paper about the business case for DITA, and it has some very helpful information in regard to the different kinds of um, cost savings and metrics uh, you could use to report to executives. Okay, thank you. I'll move on to the next question. Um, when I'm starting at DITA, how should I train writers and move them into DITA? One of the best things not to do is to have them convert content. I know it's a very easy thing to um, think about, to have them start cleaning up their own content, but I really do not recommend doing that. It causes a lot of change resistance. If people are having to learn the DITA model, they're having to learn a new tool, that is pretty stressful on its own. So don't add conversion on there first. I think the better thing to do instead is to maybe talk about more generic writing, um, writing features that you need to know about or, or writing theory that debt that did a help support. Talk a little bit about, you know, what structured authoring is what topic-based authoring is, then move into DITA and how it can support those things. 
and then start moving into you know the content have some examples ready have some converted examples ready that show your company's content in data because people can then use that as basically a guideline uh, to help them understand how to apply data to the company's content so it's better to maybe have that converted content some of it ready to go and to show instead of having these employees convert right after they start to learn about data. Okay, great. Um, and then kind of off of that, um, how is structured authoring going to be different for the writers? In desktop publishing, you are generally applying formatting directly as you apply tags. This is true of FrameMaker, Microsoft Word, for example. So in FrameMaker, you're usually seeing pretty much what your print output is going to look like. It's, it's what you see is what you get. The, the display, the interface in FrameMaker is showing you what that PDF is going to look like. In XML, the theory is a little bit different in structured authoring. Instead, what you see is one option. You may be using an interface in an XML authoring tool that gives you a fairly bare bones basic look at what the formatting is going to look like. The actual true formatting for your PDF content, your web content, your EPUB book or whatever will be applied automatically later. So you don't control every single formatting decision. The transformation processes do that for you. That's one of the significant differences. And I would recommend taking a look at a web paper that we have on Scriptorium's website. Um, it's called uh, Structured Authoring in XML. We updated it just a few years ago. It's been out there for a while. So look up that white paper. It has a very good explanation of the leap it takes in thinking to get from desktop publishing to XML authoring. Okay. And I think that we're out of questions. If anybody has any more, go ahead and type them in in the next few seconds or so, and we'll get them answered. Um, but you can also send questions to experts at learningdata.com, and we'll drop that email address into the chat module. Um, so you can email us later if you have any more questions after this webinar. Um, and I don't see any more questions, so Alan, I think we're done. Great, thank you, and thanks everybody for attending today. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for our first Learning Data Live series presentation, and be sure to follow us um, at Learning Data on Twitter and at Scriptorium for updates on our next Learning Data Live series event. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>